Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Some statistics for people to think about are pretty impressive when you think about two years from now. That is the year 2020. We will see more than half of all workers involved in what is known as a gig economy. The question is, is, are we ready for such a seismic shift in our work lives? Is there room for everyone, and how can an individual such as yourself possibly compete? We're going to learn today about the realities of what it truly takes to win in a world of increasing choice and how to compete and how to put the best versions of ourselves up front and center. On the program today, we're going to be talking with Olga Mizrahi as she is a national speaker and marketing expert on the gig economy. Her newest book, The Gig is Up, is going to be talking about these very realities and what we need to know to be able to attract things such as new clients, what an independent freelancer versus freelance business owner is, and redeeming yourself after a slump and more. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest and expert on the gig economy, Ms. Olga Mizrahi. Olga, thank you for being on the program today. Happy to be here. Well, listen, how did you get involved in the gig economy? When did you first start? I know when I was reading uh, in your book, you're kind of what they call an early adapter to the Internet. Let's talk about that. True. So when I was graduating my undergrad from the University of California, Irvine, I became fascinated with the computer lab, even though I was graduating in psych and social behavior. And the idea that you know I could plan my whole trip to San Francisco using Netscape was exciting. This was the late 90s, and it was absolutely shocking that within pretty much a year of my graduation, my university was asking me to come back and teach web design. Uh, By that time, I had been self-taught in web design and had worked for a startup company, and so I was just really floored that they would want a 24-year-old to teach people that were basically older than her um, (laughs) about the web. And uh, that didn't last for long because I immediately got scooped up by one of my students, um, which is PIMCO, um, the large bond fund manager. And the thing is, when you think back to what it means to teach at a university, especially at such a young age, I was completely freaked out, right? Because (laughs) first of all, who's going to listen to a 24-year-old? But second of all, I had to kind of swallow my pride and say, look, I don't know if I'm the right fit here. Like, I don't have a master's degree. Don't I need a master's degree to teach this course? And they're like, oh, thanks for reminding us. And they like pull out a piece of paper out of the desk drawer, the, gold, the, the famous goldenrod piece of paper, and they sign it. And on the top it says work equivalency. Let me tell you what a life-altering experience that is, to understand that these ideas, these constructs that you had about how you get hired and how you get chosen all of a sudden just fly in the wind when you're on the demand side of the equation. So that was kind of my first foray into really contract work uh, and technology at the same time. And over the years, I've worked in in corporate and full-time. And um, uh, in 2004, I started a creative agency here in Long Beach, California called Oso Design. And through that, have really been part of the gig economy, both taking on gig work, and also hiring gig workers now for close to, you know, 15 years. So let's go ahead and define what the gig economy is precisely. Now, I can honestly say I have a pretty good idea of it because, well, to a large degree, what I'm doing right now is part of this new paradigm. I remember when I started, and it was interesting to find out that you, too, had been involved with PBS, I understand. Correct. I okay. served on a council there. Yeah. Oh, right on. Well, see, that's how I actually started my radio career was OPB in Portland, Oregon, which is part of the PBS network. And one of the things that I found as I was doing a radio show up there called Profiles was <clears throat> the question is, well, how do I attract listeners? You know, is anybody listening? That sort of a thing. And I, I remember, and I think this is a very valuable piece of advice for people to really pay attention to. It doesn't matter whether you want to do radio or you don't. It doesn't matter, but it's really, to me, the backbone of your book, and that is changing the beliefs and the direction for what your action is all about. Okay? 
So to give clarity to that is if you go in thinking, let's say, in my particular uh, instance, well, I'm going to go out there because I'm of this belief everybody's going to want to listen to me and they're going to want to embrace what I'm saying, you know, because I think that I produce a really good show. But the bottom line is that's not a very good motivation. It's a nice byproduct, but my motivation should be the best kind of person in this particular arena where people want to and, quite frankly, demand to want to have more of what I'm putting out there. And I think when you can make that mental shift, you know, when you can change that belief, then you realize this gig economy can be a very good thing to have. And that's a lot of what what you talk about here in your book. Correct. So I'm so glad you brought that up because really there is so much confusion and so much anxiety surrounding the gig economy. And for good reason, okay, it is kind of confusing. But yet there is so much opportunity. So if we take a step back and let's go ahead and define the gig economy. The way that I define the gig economy based on all my research is a very simple definition. And that is a project-based or on-demand services that can be provided by anyone. Okay, very simple answer. And so it's not just Uber and Upwork and Airbnb you know, it's really all freelance jobs too. When you think about temp and contract workers, like 1099 workers, even if they're hired offline, right, they're found on LinkedIn, but they're hired offline, are they now giggers? Well, the answer is yes to all the above because the gig economy is incredibly diverse. It can include people like you who are producing their own show. Um, you would probably be in the, con- uh, in the context of a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, but it's still project-based work. And so contract workers, freelance CEOs, uh, consultants all fall in there. And so when we first think of somebody that does gig work or project-based work or 1099 work, we might immediately go towards somebody that's like a freelance journalist or a photographer or like a web designer. And true, the number one industry for freelancers is computer and IT, right? That's probably not surprising. But I think what is surprising is that we're seeing other industries come in at such a rapid pace that there seems to be room for everyone. And I'm talking about surprising industries like education and training and medical and health and like HR professionals. If you would have thought one area would have stayed completely corporate, it would have been HR, right? Right, exactly. And here we have all of these HR professionals that are project-based workers that will go in to a particular company it could be based on their size or just, you know, just the way that the, that the company looks at project-based work. But the, a lot of those HR functions now are being outsourced to gig workers. Well, and, and it's interesting because, like you said, there's a lot of confusion about what the gig economy is. And I think one of the biggest confusing parts of the gig economy, and we can also say misperceptions is, what a person believes they can own. Now, here's where the one of the first big beliefs really needs to be examined, and that is I can go in and I can, let's say, freelance my services. Well, first of all, the question is, do you think you're ready for the work that's involved? So the first misperception of that is I get to do a little bit, but I get to make a lot of money doing this while I'm sitting at home. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about that first one right there. Okay, so before we, before we go into that, let's just make one really clear point. And that is, sometimes when we think of freelancers, we go, well, freelancers have been around forever, right? I mean, I have a lot of translators um, that are part of my audience, and I might, I might argue that that's the original gig worker, right? I think the, the first documented job is like in 300 AD. And so what is so different, and specifically so different over the past five years, and it's what's sitting in your pocket, what I'm talking to you on, which is the smartphone. It's the technology there that has added rocket fuel, and I mean absolute tremendous rocket fuel to this. So when you say to yourself, okay, I could now take this job that I'm doing at corporate, become a consultant, and do it from home, and yippee yay, okay, so that's possible. But I think the first question ends up being, am I going to do this through an app? or a platform, or am I going to kind of hoof it on my own based on my 
connections that I already know. So the hoofing it on your own, that's very similar to the entrepreneur and solopreneur path. The only difference is now you're going to be required to be responsive on that technology 24-7, right? Anybody that's been involved in a Slack channel can, can tell you how quickly out of control that communication can become. And yet we are all now conditioned through text messages, through apps, through ordering our Uber to know exactly where anybody stands on our project at any given time. So what happens now when you get pinged, you know, off hours or whatever? So that in itself is a change, right, that you have to kind of know that you're walking into. This ability to be available very quickly, that response time has to be there. And that's true whether you are online or offline. If I'm a consultant on Upwork or if I'm just somebody who got a job through LinkedIn, that immediacy and responsiveness is expected. Okay, so when we look at that, know that for sure, regardless of whether you're online or offline. Now, the other thing of this, depending on what platform you're on, that's the big change there because the platform itself takes the anxiety of getting paid out of the equation. If you've been in business long enough, you know, I hate to inform people who haven't gone into business for themselves yet, but if you've been in business long enough, there will come a time where you will not get paid or there will be some confusion on the scope of work and you did 10 times the amount of work and you got paid hardly anything for it. That happens. And it's a, and it's a hard lesson to learn. And that's what the promise of these platforms are. You know, I'm an Airbnb super host. As soon as somebody checks into the property, within 24 hours, I have a direct deposit in my account of what, you know, of their entire stay. So even if they leave at 5 p.m. that night, their entire stay is paid for. Airbnb has put that already in my account. So that is a huge promise that these platforms in the gig economy give and also alleviate some of that anxiety of going out on your own. Yeah, I know you were talking a lot about, you know, things such as invoicing, and I realize one of the things that people uh, may overlook is the fact that, well, eventually if you're making this money, you're going to have to start accounting for it. You're going to have to start <laughs> understanding things like tax codes, and the question is, how do you become a bookkeeper? And I know, uh, you know, you uh, gave some examples of things can take a look at, but talk about how important that is, because we've actually addressed this question, or actually, let's talk, we actually had full segments on minding your money you know sure maybe you think you can go ahead and pass it off to someone else but we certainly have heard plenty of stories where somebody takes their other money and they run <laughs> oh my well that's the other thing right so we talk about how these gig platforms kind of you know i'm assuming that we're going with a, a gig platform that's known like a care.com or an airbnb or you know not some crazy app that we don't even know where it originates from, a.k.a. China, right? So if we're going on one of these platforms, that's one of the promises that they make. Not only that you're going to get paid, but we're going to show you how the accounting kind of works. We're going to make sure that you get basically 1099 from us, and you can see those cash inflows, outflows, or whatever. And, in a, in a, and what's interesting is on a platform like Care.com, it actually works for the person that's doing the hiring as well. So we know, we all know of a story, I'm sure, of a politician that's got in, gotten in trouble for not paying their nanny properly, right? So something like Care.com is promising that on both sides of the equation that uh, the money is accounted for and that they'll actually even help the, you know, the family that, let's say, hires the nanny with the whole tax process as well. So that's one of the promises that these platforms are making to the users and why they become so attractive. When we're talking about starting out as an independent contractor or um, you know, a solopreneur, that's where the traditional, here's how you start a business, maybe you learn some QuickBooks, maybe you learn some fresh books, maybe you keep um, you know, uh, up on the news of the new tax codes you know, immediately, even this year, it's like, do I start an LLC? What do I, you know, what do I do with these new things? So you start bringing in resources or informational sources that become in some ways your advisory council, right, to make sure that you have a successful run of this. 
Now, let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about the uh, types of people that are going to be involved in the gig economy. And you broke down what seemed to be five categories. And I'll go through those real quickly, and we can kind of give some definitions to give people a feeling, well, where do I belong in all this? Because the biggest thing is, once you decide, if you make the decision, first of all, to participate in the gig economy, what category would you like to be in? Where is your commitment, and what values and mindset are you ready to put in action? So the first one is independent contractors. Let's talk about who these people are. That's a pretty broad. Um, well, more of a definition of who they are, I guess, and, and what percentage you think will be involved in the gig economy as an independent contractor. Well, I think by you mentioned at the top of this program, that by the year 2020, it's estimated that 50% of the U.S. workforce will be working independently. Right. But the, the thing is with that definition is I think it's important to understand that there's people that are doing this, let's say, one particular gig full-time, kind of going from project to project. There are some people that are kind of cobbling together multiple gigs and carving out what would be you know full time or above, and there's a lot of people that are still working with a primary traditional job, whether it's full time or part time, and just kind of basically moonlighting, right, on the right. side. Mm-hmm. So, so it is pretty. Like I said, it's kind of a a broad definition. So, um, can you help me out a little bit by? Okay, uh, so clearly, just before I asked the question, decided to go with the categories. Is this the mindset when you want to get involved in the gig? the gig economy, what is your focus and your commitment? You know, what do you decide? Do you want to do this part-time? Do you want to do this full-time? Do you want to become a multimillionaire, I guess? <laughs> right. That's basically what I was getting at. Maybe I jumped <laughs> to a point where you were like, okay, I could see where your confusion on this would be. So that's what I was going to define it as. Okay, and i got to tell you, it, it kind of depends on the person, right? And it depends on the circumstance. There's a huge difference between people who are forced into the gig economy and maybe they don't want to be there, uh, and but they have to just to make the ends beat, and people who are there willingly. Uh, overwhelmingly, the people that are there willingly wouldn't have it any other way. Even if it's just something that they tried out and then it kind of worked for them, they don't go back to corporate or full-time work. Um, the thing to kind of keep in mind is that one of the opportunities that we have in front of us today is that you really can dip your toe in the water. So when you talk about the commitment level involved, there is a possibility to just kind of say, okay, you know, I'm still kind of working this part-time or full-time job. I really think that the skill set would apply and do well in this other arena. You can try it out. And a lot of it, what's amazing to me is that there's a seismic shift going on also in the full-time workforce in corporate that they are embracing kind of side gigs. You know, there's a company by the name of ConvertKit, CEO's Nathan over there, and he doesn't want the company to grow to more than like 50 people. They just posted their, uh, I think two months ago, their first million-dollar month of revenue with, I think it's 38 employees. And one of the interesting things about that company and the way that it's structured is people are encouraged to have side gigs, whether it's their passion projects or just you know time with their kids or maybe a cause that they're passionate about. Even the CEO himself, Nathan, has a woodworking shop and you know runs this multi-million dollar company and at the same time sells you know, live edge cutting boards <laughs> on the side. And it sounds kind of ridiculous, maybe in this kind of hipster way, and yet corporations are finally starting to understand that people are kind of multifaceted, and they can bring in some of this some of this side gig stuff. So, you know, maybe you have the type of situation that they wouldn't, uh, you know, frown on you or fire you if they knew that you were participating in a particular side gig. They might even encourage it. And so you have an opportunity to kind of dip your toe in the water. Find a platform that has that particular skill set. I'm, if, if you can kind of tell, I'm not spitting out 10 million platforms that you can try. Because it's no, not so, at all. Mm-hmm. 
you have to do your research yourself. You know what I mean? Like there are, for instance, there's, there's a, I'll just give you an example. There's, there's a, a, a gig platform called Field Nation. And so maybe you come from more of like a, I'm, I'm just kind of a, a pulling from one of the things that I know that they do hire for, but these are field technicians, right? They're going out and working on, let's say, HVAC systems. Right. If you have this type of background, if there's possibility now to get work where you're still working within like larger type of maintenance and buildings and maybe even large corporate clients, but you're on the gig side, you're actually, you know, working in essence within the Field Nation platform and getting work and send, sent out to different uh, areas that way. So it's like there's there's probably a space, an app, <laughs> a something that has that place for you, but it does take that research and, quite frankly, familiarity with the platform in order to succeed on it. So even kind of dipping your toe in the water, you still have to kind of fully commit to showing the best of you, right? That's the key. So if you're just kind of like putting your toe out there, but you, know, you don't have a good profile picture and you're not really telling much about why anybody should choose you, and then you're like, nah. I got one job, they didn't pay me enough, and they didn't tell me enough about what was going on, and so this gig stuff sucks. It's like, okay, but when you're in the gig economy, it's now on you to present yourself in the best possible way so that you get chosen, so that people see those shining qualities about you. And it's also up to you, by the way, to almost over-ask, over-communicate, so that the scope of work is very clear and that you set expectations and exceed them every time. That's how you get hired again. You know, and it's really unique as you look at this book, The Gig is Up, is because you realize the same thing applies in the gig economy, in my opinion, as it does in the world of brick-and-mortar work. You know, when it comes to getting hired, to getting that job, even with your expertise, you're going to be competing with, you know, X amount of many other people. So what is it that you're bringing that really makes it stand out? And to give you an example, uh, you mentioned Airbnb, so I'm thinking hotels or, you know, a place to go and stay overnight. Uh, living in Scottsdale, Arizona, if anybody has ever been down here in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, they will realize this place is just loaded with hotels and resorts. And, I mean, in some cases in one city block, it seems like there's at least three of them. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot yeah. of choices down here. There was one particular hotel that I kind of that caught my eye. I decided to go to. It was uh, part of the Hyatt chain. I mean, this is a worldwide company here. So I went down there and I'm looking at this place. The first thing that struck me was going to their front counter, and I realized these people look awfully casually dressed for you know what you would expect for a Hyatt. So I began to pull one aside, and I said, you know, why don't you tell me a little bit about this place here? You know, what's going on? I, I really get this really laid-back, comfortable vibe about this place. It's just different from the gold jacket you typically see and the stuffiness. And what I was told was they originally had created this concept as an offshoot, okay, that the feeling was we wanted to bring people on board to work here who could just be themselves. In other words, we wanted mm -hmm. people who stay here to get the feeling that maybe they were visiting people in their own neighborhood. Now, that, Well, that's a little bit different. So tell me more about, you know, the whole concept, because I'm seeing some really unique, you know, let's just say uh, furniture in the lobby, uh, things on the wall, sort of like this little art shop. And they said, well, you know, there's a bunch of resorts there, but how they decided to really – showcase a difference, that unique selling proposition, if you will, or value point, is that they wanted to concentrate on art, more specifically local artists, and showcase that. And so that's why they called the different parts of their property things like easel and studio and so forth and so on, they were <laughs> right. telling me, right? And I'm telling you, this place stays pretty packed, you know, and they do a lot of events there. And I was really impressed to think, there is that vibe. You can't really put your finger on it maybe in the first hour or two hours, but I think as you stay there for a day, you realize this really is unique. So let's talk about how important that is, especially in a gig economy. And believe me, like you said, there, it may, you may be a freelance journalist or let's say somebody who's uh, uh, you know editing or correcting grammar papers, but what is it you do that makes you that unique person, that value proposition that you talk about? So 
I find what is amazing about what your experience was at this hotel is that you're looking at a <laughs> an attempt from corporate to capture what's going on right now, which is this need for uniqueness and this need for, in some ways, imperfection. And the reason that I say that is I find that boomers especially have this notion that they have to, if they're going to put themselves out there, it has to be perfect and polished. And for a moment, ask yourself where that came from. We've been conditioned to basically being a product of industrialization, right? I'm I glad, Olga, you support. said that. And let me say this. just to, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it excites me to hear you say that because just last night <laughs> as I was talking to my partner and my wife, I said, that's exactly what our belief system is built on, and it was based on a story you shared in there in a book uh, of the generation that told us the harder you work, the more you'll be rewarded. You know what? BS. <laughs> and it's been that well, way for a lot of decades, actually, in, in many cases. At some point, right, we were told that not only the harder that you work, but towards what end, right, towards this uh, Six Sigma end, towards this allowance of, of only a certain amount of tolerance when it comes to perfection, right? And yet people can't ever get to Six Sigma, you know, which is a standard in uh, manufacturing practice where a particular small tolerance is given so that two pieces fit well together. I definitely want Six Sigma in my jet, right? When I'm flying across the country, I want to make sure that that jet was made in a factory that it's Sure, absolutely. Six Sigma, mm-hmm. okay? But people as themselves, as a product, that's not who we are. And so we have an entire shift going on. You know, forget about the gig economy for a second. Is there a way that you prefer a restaurant to be? You know, is there something, when you feel something special, like you're not going to tell anybody about the so-so tiramisu that you had. It's something excellence. It's this striving for excellence. And excellence is a lot different than perfection. You know, Olga, and I'm glad you used the restaurant situation there because when it comes to perfection from the corporate mindset, an industry, in my opinion, hasn't become more sloppy than that one. When these large corporations are buying up restaurants and they're trying this cookie-cutter way about how we take care of our guests and what they think a guest expectations are and how often they miss that just from the simple process of how they bring people on board. Okay, so you want somebody to give a personal touch to a guest that comes into your restaurant. Okay, well, for you to be able to achieve that, here's the first thing you need to do. You need to go online to our anonymous application. You need to put your name and your contact information and your experience in there. And some anonymous person whom you may never, ever meet is going to probably contact you to decide whether or not you're going to be part of the interview pool. Okay, there's your first disconnection right there. Where's the personal part that makes me think, do I even want to work for this company? You've got to go through that process now. And then, you know, then there's the HR and the, and the other thing there. And so you're seeing all these little restaurants pop up now that are giving people exactly what they're looking for, which is that personal connection, because that's how they're also hiring their local staff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're you're not going to get an argument out of me there. My first book is Sell Local, Think Global. So, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of local, and I'm a big fan of, you know, I'm a big fan of people, quite frankly. And right. I feel that your listeners have this tremendous opportunity to bring the best in themselves to the table and succeed in a way that you can make a living. You know, I don't like this idea of I'm going to immediately go into the gig economy and make six figures. I will tell you this, as a boomer that has more experience, you have the absolute best chance in a specialized way of making that six figures. We see that people who come to the table with more experience in the gig economy get rewarded. But no, even if you're the best, if nobody knows about you, like if you're not willing to stick your neck out there, then 
you're sunk before you begin. And that's one of the other kind of thought shifts that you have to understand as you go into this space. It's incredibly scary to put your flipping neck out there. And yet almost any platform that you're on, you're going to get reviews. You know, I have whatever ratings I have on Airbnb. Five stars, thank you very much. I have whatever ratings I have when you go on Amazon and read about the book. And believe me, if I get a bad review or a negative review, it hurts. Like it's something that, you know, stings for a little bit. But you have an opportunity, depending on the platform, depending on the, uh, the, the, how public the sphere is and, and everything, even Yelp, you know, you have an opportunity to, to really make some choices about that. You know, you can only control your own kind of reaction, right? right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people go, well, I'm not sticking my head out there at all. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, you kind of don't have a choice. At some point, someone will stick your head out for you. Someone, like if you're on, you know, uh, LinkedIn and your profile is not all the way kind of completed and you don't have recommendations, that also says something about you. So people are going to make that judgment pretty quick. And you say, ah, don't judge me. Really? Think about the way that you might use Yelp or how you find a restaurant, speaking of restaurants, in a new town. You immediately go and you look at it, and maybe you're one of the people that, you know, I need to read a negative review just to know if this person, I'm going to make a judgment on the person making a negative review and see if they're like me or if they're complaining about something asinine, and then I'm just going to go and, you know, give that restaurant business. And so I get reviewed both positive and negative on so many different platforms now that that creates a story about who I am. But it also lets people know that I know my stuff, that I know how to energize an audience, that I can come in and make a difference for a crowd, right? So that type of stuff that's out there has a purpose and it gets you chosen. It's really hard though because again, the perfect is the enemy of the of the good, quite frankly, especially for females, to say, I'm going to go ahead and put myself out there, even if somebody captures a video of me and my hair isn't awesome that day. You know, <laughs> like right. that's tough to do. And now, yet, you I was can't gonna, be anonymous in a cubicle anymore. Uh-huh. So what is it about women that have a harder time, do you think? Because we also have the, the beauty expectation and the biases from our culture put on top of us. Yeah, I can understand that. Absolutely. So even uh, even being um, even that your hair color has a difference in how you're received as mm-hmm. a woman. There are studies that show that um, women uh, lighten their hair because of how they're received uh, in the workforce, so that they'll be less threatening. Things like that that I don't think guys have to worry about. <laughs> Well, that or they just have to look as good as, well, I don't know, six-pack abs or something like that. But, hey, you know, if you're doing <laughs> editing online, what difference does it, does it make? Right. <laughs> Eat all the chips there you want. There might be a spot for everybody, right? <laughs> but, if you're, but, hey, if you're a personal trainer, right, and you say, I want to make it in the gig economy, well, guess what? I have a limited amount of attention, and I'm only going to give my money to the people that I think are the best. And if I'm following somebody on Instagram or Facebook or whatever – and they're posting like every day and tons of helpful tips and this new workout and whatever, and then at some point they say, okay, we're going to do this live event, I might say, yeah, I want to do that. And that's how that person is able to monetize or or make revenue from this type of new way of work. Whereas like even if you've been a personal trainer and have had a a great career for a long time and now you say, okay, now I'm going to do this and strike out on my own, but you're like, holy crap, I have to post on Instagram every day? I have to make up new workouts every day? Well, then maybe that's not for you because that's what that particular uh, type of, of occupation demands when you're out there in the gig economy. Now, if you are locally a trainer and locally known, then the idea of convenience is going to be the best for someone. And maybe they also want to see you in person. And it might be enough to just put together some information and post every so often, just get the word out or through your email list or whatever it is, and like hold a class in the parks like we have around here everywhere, you know, where it's just a a group of 20 people, and that might sustain you. So all of a sudden, you know, the dynamics change based on how you understand kind of the, the, 
what your market is and what they want. And so it might be enough to have 100 true fans of you in your local area, and that might be enough to make a living all, all year round, right? Maybe you don't need a million Instagram followers. You know, that's a very important point that I think our listeners should be aware of is what are your expectations uh, going into this? Now, uh, as we were talking about earlier about the concept of, or shall we say, the belief system that was created about, you know, the harder I work, you know, the bigger I'm going to be uh, rewarded. And so one of the things I think people coming into this, especially if they're new, is they'll, it's sort of like those director network marketing companies. You know, they go in with all these delusions of grandeur that they're going to try to get every person on planet Earth as either someone to be recruited or somebody to be sold to. And it's funny how back in the 80s when you would see these signs posted up on telephone poles promising an extra two to $200 to $1,000 a week or something like that, and somebody was going around with a box knife and cutting out some of the numbers because apparently they wanted that whole neighborhood. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> can serve everybody, believe me. So let's talk about these apps, you know, that sort of maybe dangle that perception out there. For instance, Uber. And you talk about how you sh- don't be a slave to the app. What does that mean exactly? Because that's the first trap I think a lot of people get caught up into. Sure. So. First of all, let's, let's, uh, let's put this in context. There's really only about 4% of the workforce right now that's making like a, a, a good go at these apps. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. You know, there's the, I think only 30% of the workforce is even aware that they can go on these apps and make a living or find an app that's for them, right? Because maybe – it, it starts and stops at Uber for them and they're thinking, or Airbnb, and they say, I don't want anybody in my house, <laughs> right? And right. That's that. <laughs> so, but let's just say that you do want to be an Uber driver or you're a handy person and you want to get on Handy or TaskRabbit or something like that. These apps are built for engagement with the app. They want to keep you in there and on their platform. They don't want... You know, just like the guy with the box cutter, now it's not the box cutter, but hey, it's Uber versus Lyft and, you know, TaskRabbit versus Handy. And, and uh, you know, they're trying, believe me, if they, they had a way to do the box cutter thing, they'd probably do it. Right, exactly. But, uh, but what happens is their version of the box cutter is this. If you are uh, a handyman on TaskRabbit and you don't respond within 30 minutes, you get downgraded. Your profile will not be shown as often, and you won't be basically earning kudos within the system that allows you to get more work. So they want to give the possibility of the work to the people that are the most active and, of course, rated well within their platforms. So it's kind of a misnomer to think that when I order an Uber, that the nearest Uber driver gets the opportunity to come over and drive me. It might not be the nearest guy. It might be a guy that's five minutes more away, but that is the most active on Uber and also very well rated. Uber is going to give a preference to that guy because they want drivers that drive using their app, (laughs) right? So when I say don't get kind of trapped in the app, It's very easy, you know, think about how these software engineers have been uh, using their brilliance to what's called gamify us. So give cues that fire up our brain's dopamine reward centers and have us chasing after badges and stars and, you know, little bleeps on our phones and things like that. And so it's not that that's going to go away or you shouldn't be on it because that exists, because that exists on all apps and all platforms. But know when it's kind of being detrimental to you and your life. Um, I had a, an assistant um, that I actually mentioned in the book. Her name's Emma. And she was relaying a TaskRabbit um, type of story to me where 
she had gone onto a job. So she's at a TaskRabbit job, and the job was hanging pictures in this law office. So she puts her phone in her back pocket, and she starts banging away on the walls. Unbeknownst to her, she had gotten a request for a task, and she hadn't heard it. She, you know, finishes the job, looks at her phone, and, you know, gets this basically negative message from TaskRabbit saying, uh-oh, you didn't respond within 30 minutes. We had to put this job to someone else, and now, you know, now you got kind of a little ding on your, on your record. <laughs> you know, and she was, she was furious. She's like, what else can I do? I have it on. I have it in my pocket. I have it on loud, you know. And so she missed out on that next opportunity. So sometimes it's kind of brutal in that way. And by the way, it's the same for me when I'm on Airbnb. Airbnb would absolutely love it if my place in Mammoth Lakes, California, was on something called Instant Book so that anybody from all over the world could book it instantly as long as those dates were available. I don't have it on that. I like to take a look at who's staying, how many people are staying, and maybe have a couple questions and answers back and forth, and then I'll prove them. By the way, I usually do that within 15 minutes. I do it really, really super quick, but they want it to be within a matter of milliseconds not minutes, right? In the Mammoth Lakes market, I can still get away with that because I'm high, highly rated and man. But if my place was in Paris, France, not only would I need to be on instant book, I'd probably have to have a third-party autoresponder that would immediately get back to the person because in Paris, France, the response rate is in, measured in milliseconds, not minutes. So that kind of gives you the, the spectrum of how this kind of response rate thing, you know, works. Conversely, I get contacted, whether it's by press or by speaking opportunities, usually via LinkedIn or directly by email or, you know, could be through my publicist as well. But the expectation is that I will respond right away, right away. So even though I'm not on Airbnb's instant book, right, there's a change in our culture in how, like when the person that's doing the choosing choosing needs an answer to a question, they expect that response right away because we're used to texting each other, right, and getting a response right away. Or any of these platforms tie into our text feeds or they act like text themselves. So again, immediately coming through on my phone, and they want that immediate response. So, you know, that's kind of a change that is um, happening regardless of online or offline, meaning if you get hired online or offline. And that is something to really think about in how we not only make ourselves stand out, but compete in this kind of new economy. Um, And I think that that's a big shift, especially for boomers, uh, you know, going, ah, I'm not super comfortable with that quick response. I'm not super comfortable using my technology. Or, you know, all of a sudden I responded to somebody negatively and I thought that that was private, but it's public. Oh, yeah. Anytime you do anything that isn't face-to-face in a dark closet somewhere, somebody else is going to find out about it. In fact, I wanted to go ahead, and that's an interesting point because one of the the big platform we obviously use is YouTube. You know, it's a great mm-hmm. place where we'll post like this show, for instance, will be posted. And there are times that, you know, when you talk about immediate response, well, you know, a comment may come in and I'll get notified by email, but I don't jump on that right away and respond right away because I know that I'm not going to get a response right away. But what it becomes is more of a permanent thread about, the philosophy and how people feel about what this particular discussion is about. It's also a platform I get to weigh and measure. Are people really gratified with the kind of work that we're producing out there? And thankfully, I can say that our thumbs up to thumbs down ratio is incredibly different. You know, I mean, it's it's really a cool thing to see. But what's more fascinating are the threads that happen <clears throat> as a result of particular shows. Like, for instance, there was one we were doing on sibling abuse, for instance. And you see this thread, and what I like to do also is I like to kind of lay back just a little bit, but not too much, where other people are talking to each other as a result of what brought them together, which was this particular show or this segment, right? 
And it's funny, so here's my, because we've actually talked about uh, how do you respond, for instance, uh, on the Internet when it comes to people with negative comments. And I say, well, there are two ways to do this. A, you can just not respond at all, or respond in a positive way that puts the responsibility of their comment back into their lap. So to give you an example, there was a gentleman that was talking about, or in his thread, he was saying, did you realize this doctor that you have on your show is on Quack Watch? And I'd never even heard of Quack Watch before. Apparently, there was this website that was created by four allegedly arrogant doctors, as I read in a magazine mm. article once, that decided they're going to create this website that basically debunks or calls a bunch of different doctors quacks. And as a result, of course, you're not going to take any information that doctor says seriously. Strangely enough, when you go to the website, you realize they've also got people like Oprah Winfrey on there, and she's not even a doctor. <laughs> but the fact is, is so this guy's ranting and raving. And so the first question I had to him is, what credibility does Quack Watch actually have as a website? It's just an obvious logical question, being the Internet at times can be the bathroom wall of the world. Big news, big news. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> something like that, sure. Now, but I wasn't saying that. I was just saying, what credibility does this website actually have? I'd never even heard of it before. So he rants and raves, which was fine by me, to say, well, it's this, 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 and this. And I said, okay, well, let's get back to why you came to this specific topic. Okay, this is about, I think it was about blood pressure or something like that. And I said, uh, what's the, you know, you spend a lot of time telling me about how great Quack Watch is, but do you have any solutions for the people who are trying to find ways to change their lives for the better because of the condition they have physically. See, I was taking his negative comment and I was putting the responsibility back into his lap. Why don't you take some of this research savvy you have about how great Quack Watch is and tell these people who come to hear this segment what they can do to improve their lives. And, you know, when you take that stance, especially in negative comments, you'd be amazed that either, A, they will respond and say, okay, sure, I could do that, or you never hear from them again. <laughs> right, right. So that, that's, you know, what you just talked about is a skill for this new economy, right? This idea that if you are out there, and you will be, have to be, putting your neck out there, at some point, you might get something, you know, some shade thrown your way. <laughs> right? Oh, you're going to get more than shade. I've had people throw tree trunks, and I find it quite amusing, actually. <laughs> well, you're you're maybe a good uh, a troll avenger, but um, but for most of us, we're not going to have to deal with an entire comment thread based on you know media that we might put out there, right? But we will have to deal with our own work, right? The, our own work that we put out there and the reviews that come from that. And so in a lot of ways, people are like, ah, I put my neck out there because that's so scary. But just know you have the opportunity to weigh in on the conversation. And even though you're responding to that person, obviously, and you know this, what you're really doing is helping people choose you in, because of how you respond. I agree. Yeah, say I could be beating this person back up or criticizing them, but no, I choose to say, how can you contribute with your knowledge to help these people get what they're trying to find? Right, and in that way, you're being a helpful host, helping the audience that's reading the comment thread in order to get an idea of how to deal with the problem that they came to research on in the first place. In the the other the other way is that you know when you don't respond that's also a response right that's also a choice that you're making that's okay in certain forums you have the ability to privately respond so it's not going to be in a public forum but you have a way of providing a certain level of customer service even to somebody who's belligerent or irate or whatever and that can be your own the way that you choose to deal with the world your own ethics and then the, the third thing of when you're responding publicly, of course, you're responding to that person, but like we said, it's really you're responding to the whole world. And that's going to show your character. And character counts. Like That's one of the things that we talked about here is that part of this is your unique personality. So you have your unique skill set, but you also have your unique personality. And you're looking for that fit. 
and not everybody's going to like you and not everybody's going to hire you and that's okay. But if you're memorable, then you'd be surprised by like, I always have these like surprise referral sources that come later. I don't know if you do too, but like, Oh yeah, they come be, and you're like, wow, how did that happen? And I'll, be, but, I'll be like, how'd you how'd you find me? And they'll be like, oh, so and so saw you speak two years ago, and remembered you, and said I should call you. I'm like, okay, you know, like that works for me. Know. Even though my response time for my Airbnb is less than a half a millisecond, you know what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But certain things come, you know, they they come later because it's an it's a way that. Because this is not about just getting one project and then a whole unique other project and then a whole unique other project. That's true if you are on a particular platform like Uber. You might have different rides all the time, right? But in most of these cases, you would like to be on a project that you can get hired. Like if you have a good fit with a particular company or a group of individuals or a team, like you want to get hired again. You want to work with them again. So they have to know that, first of all, you're available and that, you know, you're a good fit, but also maybe the other types of skills and things that you bring to the table, like for that next project. And that takes kind of the communication skills, the soft skills um, that really aren't talked up as much. Uh, You know, I like to say that sometimes in the gig economy, we get all excited because we've lost the middleman. Ooh, I can get that person directly. That's awesome. I can save some money (laughs) by hiring that person directly. And then you realize, hold on. That middleman helps me communicate with that person. And this person isn't the best communicator. They may have a great skill that I want, you know, a coding skill, a programming skill, whatever. And yet, oh, my God, they're terrible at communication. And I, and I now pine for that middle layer, that project manager that was there before, even though I had to pay a little bit more. Sure. You know? And so that can actually lead to a rise of yet another skill set that we haven't even skimmed the surface of, which is, Get familiar with these platforms and get familiar with how to hire people off these platforms because guess what? Companies will want that because all of a sudden, it's not the internal project manager that knows how to manage gig workers. It's you. You know how to best create these teams and get the job done. Which is exactly what they're all looking for is the end result. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was going to mention, too, uh, just back quickly on that thread response is sometimes holding back just a little bit. In fact, you know, not responding right away, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to these trolls, as you had, had mentioned, <laughs> is this. Sometimes a lot of people recognize that person as a bully, especially if they like your work. And by you not responding right away, three, four, five, or even ten other people are going to respond to that troll for you. <laughs> yep. pretty soon it's like okay I've just been surrounded by a group of people that I don't think I want to be back here anymore so they take care yep. of it for you and that's kind of a fun thing too <laughs> which by the way if I knew that you wanted to post this on YouTube I would have gladly had a Zoom call with you you could have seen my lovely face <laughs> there you go well we'll do it anyway we'll figure something out uh, now let's go ahead and uh, spend uh, the next few minutes uh, toward the end of the show here talking about well, okay we've, we've certainly talked about it in broad strokes but a person listening to this who's not familiar with us, how they get started and what they should consider as they're getting started. Okay. So a little bit about what we mentioned before, this idea of getting familiar with these apps. Become a user yourself. So you're telling me you, you couldn't use a little help walking the dog sometimes or next time you go on that vacation, maybe stay at an Airbnb or, you know, uh, there's some handy tasks that need to be put together, like some Ikea furniture that needs to be put together at your house. Try them out because your familiarity with how they work will immediately turn on some light bulbs. You'll start to think about, well, what if I was, I know now what it is to be the one doing the choosing. Now what if I was on the other end of that? By the way, if we're talking more of a consultant relationship, there are platforms like Upwork, right? where you're competing with a worldwide audience. So if you're a writer, you may not be able to compete well as a brand new writer if you're just putting kind of like, oh, I'm going to do some editing or I can write some blog posts or whatever, when I could hire possibly somebody from the Philippines to write for 25 cents a page. You're like, I can't make a living at 25 cents a page. So you have to learn how to better communicate your skill set. So search for people like you in your area and see how they present themselves. It's kind of like figuring out an old school market map. 
but now for individuals as opposed to, to companies. So that's part of it, is researching in your particular space and then also starting to use some of the apps and platforms yourself so that you get familiar with how this stuff works. So once you're ready that now to put yourself out there, you say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do this. You might want to start with your LinkedIn uh, profile in terms of completing it all the way. So how, if I was now searching for somebody in my local area that does your specialization, how is it that you would compare to other people in terms of their LinkedIn profile? Do you have recommendations? Do you have you know, people that are writing reviews about you? Are there things that you have that you want to say, that you want to publish, that you want to just let your viewpoint or your expertise shine based on that? You know, do you have a recent profile picture? Is there something in the main picture that you can show? I don't know that most people realize that LinkedIn is trying to also compete out there. And so they give a large preference towards live video. So just like you're taping the show right now live, if you had a snippet of this that was live on LinkedIn, you know, I'm not going to say which amount because I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it is, and then you don't put any links in the actual um, description. You can put it in the comments but not in the description. I will tell you right now that that will go to the top of everybody's feed that is part of your network on LinkedIn because they have such a push right now for live video. So if you have an opportunity to kind of share a piece of your life, your personality, your expertise on a regular basis via live video on LinkedIn, right there is a way that you can stand up and get chosen. You know, so that's a, that's a tip right there. Um, beyond that, it comes down to unique value proposition. So let's be really clear about what unique value proposition is, okay? Because Again, this is one of those confusing things. Again, everybody thinks that they know what a value proposition is and a unique value proposition. Or a unique value proposition. Oh, yeah, have them give an elevator speech, and you'll know right away they don't. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Believe me, I've heard some elevator speeches like, I almost fell asleep, but I don't think you're aware of what you do. <laughs> anyway. And, you, and that in itself tells you about them, right? <laughs> you're like, and you're not getting the sales job. Okay, so a value proposition is an inherent promise of benefit that a company gives its customers, employees, or business partners. So it's very important to understand that when somebody's doing the choosing, right, if you're trying to uh, figure out who I'm going to hire, you're going to compare the alternatives. And a lot of times the benefit part and the cost part are not what you think they are. The benefit might be convenience or availability, you know, the cost might be not to do with money, right? So the fact that it's not only the customer or the hiring person, but also the business partners or in the other way, the employees, is important to understand. And again, benefit minus cost. So that's how we all choose. I don't care who you are. We always choose that way. We may not know that we're choosing that way. But that's the way we're choosing, we're comparing the alternatives, and we're saying, what's the biggest benefit for me in all these at this given time in this given place? The unique value proposition communicates the unique contribution that you, your company, products, or services are able to provide the market in a way that is markedly different than your competitors. You need to be different enough. Why should someone choose you in particular? What makes you different? The number one mistake that I've seen in the 15 years that I've been doing this for other people is people and companies talk about themselves in errors. Better, faster, stronger, cheaper. Really? You're cheaper? Because Walmart is the cheapest. And you're going to tell me you make people happier because I know where the happiest place on earth is. So we go to the extremes. The things that get our attention are the extremes. You know, like why is there even extreme Doritos? Like that's just ridiculous. Or like extreme Cheetos. It's because they've basically, all the other options are gone. Everything else is in the middle now, <laughs> right? right? So I need to have like fiery Cheetos that like put flames in my mouth. Mm. And that's what gets attention. 
Well, here's one, too. Let's go ahead and bring this up. You mentioned Walmart being the cheapest. Okay, so how does Target compete with Walmart? And it's obvious because when you go into Target, you feel their visual style somehow is just better. And they may actually be a little bit more than Walmart, but when you go into Walmart, you don't feel that same sense of visual style. So that's why you choose, but they almost seem like the same kind of store. They seem like it, but they're able to differentiate, right? Target brought in designers, the first one, by the way, Isaac Mizrahi, because <laughs> Mizrahi, I noticed, right? And so that's how they set themselves apart. You know, if you, I'm sure your listeners, and myself included, can remember back to a time where Target and Kmart were the same flipping thing. They basically were, yes. I do remember those days. Like, okay. okay, but there's something that happened with Target that set it apart, and it's the design aspect which they've explored in all sorts of different ways now and, and, and whatever. But, you know, that, that, again, that design is different. So if you provide a service, you might be different because of faster response time, right? Every app is demanding that, and now the new economy is demanding that. The ability to offer more for less, a high level of expertise, the perception that you bring more to the table than someone else, that you're able to do something, or are willing to do something that someone else is not willing to do, and the ability to time the service offering that you have with a particular need. So those are all ways that you can put that you in unique value proposition. So this is very important. Is that, in, is that being communicated and communicated clearly in your LinkedIn profile and on whatever app you're on or whatever platform you're on? You know, is your care.com profile showing that you have an expertise in elder care and has a review from a family member that says that you were amazing? And do you do that little extra? You know, the babysitter that you invite back is the one that did your dishes and you didn't ask them to. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right? And, you know, when I used to train people in the world of work, I would always try to say, or I didn't try, I would say, what you want to do is to be able to do the work of two people. What you want to do is be able to build a skill set where you become irreplaceable. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't be replaceable. What that means is it will be very hard, if not almost impossible, it will seem to replace you once you're gone. But you take that skill set with you. You grow. You develop. And there's one thing I wanted to touch on here as we're about to wrap this up, um, and that is, you know, a lot of times people will go out with the, well, if I'm cheaper, more people are going to want me. And I want to address that real quick because there's a really unique paradigm mindset there that people should be aware of. When you're less expensive, you may attract a lot of people, but you're also going to attract a whole lot of work that you didn't want to do before. These people are just never satisfied with how much they're getting for the little money they pay. The more you start increasing that income level as far as how much you charge, the people that buy into that, it may seem like you're getting less work, but those are the people that will also want less of your time from you because they have the confidence that you're good enough to do what you say you're going to do. That way they can think about something else. So be aware of that idea of I want to be the cheapest or I want to be the least expensive, you know, it's amazing how many times people say, and I'll give a real quick story. We were at a trade show one time. Sitting next to us was a, a couple that had a chocolate business. So they were selling chocolate, which I thought was, was some really great stuff. They even let us sample one or two pieces. So I'm watching for the first four hours this couple with this table out there, and they had a really nice glass display and all this. But on this table right in front of this glass display, they had a whole bunch of samples out there, and people were just coming and snatching them up like cockroaches and just taking off. And I could see the frustration in the wife's face, and I said, what's the problem here? And she says, well, these people, they just, they're coming up and grabbing the chocolate walk away. They just, you know, and so forth. And I said, well, let me ask you, was your goal here just to give away free samples, or was it to make some money? Did you want to make sales? And she says, well, obviously we want to make money so we can at least pay for our booth. And I said, would you be willing for, you know, to take a little bit of advice? And I said, you know, because I've been doing trade shows for a little while. She says, what do I do? I said, get rid of that sample table. And she says, why? I said, because then it will force these people to become curious. And once you're handing a sample over as they ask for it, there's a subtle commitment that they now have to buy something, you see. 
And she says, wow, in the last two hours, I can't believe how much we've sold. I said, yeah, get rid of the samples. <laughs> but it's amazing mm-hmm. how much we sell ourselves out that way. Yeah. And so that, that kind of leads me to, there's another piece of this, which is we talked about if you provide a service. But almost all of us also today provide something else. So maybe you're not selling the product or service, like as is, as is in the case with many nonprofits or a cause that is near and dear to your heart. But you still have to tell people what unique value they'll get for their money, right? So that may be a fit with a particular value system. Strikes a chord. The list's an emotion. Personal identification with an issue. Alleviation of anxiety. This is huge, right? It quells a negative feeling. Or some sort of tangible incentive, like a gift with donation. So when we start to understand that a lot of times now what's happening is a mix of the two, like we, we want to do business with a company that stands for something. That, you know, when I go to the supermarket, I always get the eggs that are more expensive. It's something, it's a signal that tells me that I care about the welfare of these animals. And somebody, somebody else may look at it and go, you're stupid for paying twice the amount of, for eggs that I pay. And that's, that's their story and that's what they tell themselves but when I buy those eggs the story that I'm telling myself is that hopefully there's more happy chickens in the world <laughs> <laughs> there you, you know go. after I spend five dollars on these eggs instead of two mm-hmm. you know so that's a choice that I make because of the what it means to me it strikes a chord with me it you know or it alleviates a negative emotion like I don't want to think that if I'm buying them less expensive eggs that I'm contributing to the to the wreck of a planet, you know, by what it takes to to power feedlots or, you know, whatever. And so that there's a lot of that going on. And the more that you can kind of combine the two, so you're not only kind of providing the best possible service and your for your particular skill, but you're also relaying what it means to you to be a participant <laughs> on mm-hmm. this planet, mm-hmm. you know, that means something to someone else too, and you can attract like, like, like attract like to that. So, you know, one of the things was you were asking, like, how do I get really earlier in the show? You're saying, you know, you go out there and you say, how do I get listeners for the show? What's interesting is that you can find your tribe online fairly easily now, right? You have an entire tribe surrounding your show, and they like attract like, like the 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 sounds like a lot of the people that you know, stand up to you for trolls or whatever. Those are great people. Right. And well, and that's that the beauty is, is that you will attract people. The question is, is how do you vibrate and know within yourself what that is? Now, I think you bring up something that we definitely have to close the show with and, you know, get some website and contact information, that sort of thing. But uh, what I wanted to point out is here's a unique way to look at this whole thing. Uh, going out into the world and finding out how much anxiety are you capable of relieving through what it is you have, your special gift, while at the same time building tremendous um, immovable confidence in someone. And when you can find what that balance is between those two things, I think success will actually come very easily for you. The question is, is what work are you willing to do to personally develop that so that you find that balance that you're searching for? And believe me, those people will come to you. <laughs> when when they say, if you build it, they will come, they're, they're not going to come right away, but they will come. <laughs> and then pretty yeah. soon it will be a snowball effect. You'll be like, I could have never imagined this. But that's because of all the changes you've made within yourself to adapt to all of this. And, you know, and it's and it's pretty amazing how it all works. Yeah, totally. And, you know, that confidence thing is huge. And so some people will say, and by the way, this was me too, however long ago. Like, you go, oh, I don't have the confidence to go out there and, and be this est, be this best like I'm supposed to be. So I'm kind of sunk before I begin. Well, guess what? It's a muscle that you flex, and it gets stronger. And at first, it's not so strong. It's a little weak, you know? You're on the little baby dumbbells at first. You flex it a little bit. You do the next thing. Repeat. <laughs> right. And you start to build that confidence that you really do know what you're doing. And you start to hear back from people once you kind of stick your neck out there that, hey, you did a great job. I want to hire you again. Mm-hmm. 
you know. So that's where, again, we do have, it's a big world and there is a lot of opportunity. And yes, you are now competing with somebody from the Philippines. But there's also a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I am, I'm your biggest fan. (laughs) Well, and as I was saying, just so I can be clear about it too, is how much anxiety can you relieve in others through your service or your work, while at the same time building their confidence, they should come back and see you again. And I would say this, the more anxiety you're capable of relieving in someone else through what it is you do, the more confidence that they'll have in you. And that's where the referrals and all these other crazy things start happening, like you were talking about earlier. Love it. And that's what the gig is up is all about, is finding out what that is, what you're in for. But believe me, you're in for a wild ride when you decide to go ahead and jump on that that, that particular ride and go for it. You know, Olga, I want to thank you so much for being on the program today. This is definitely an eye-opening book. What I like about it is that, unlike a lot of books in this arena that promise you these wonderful possibilities, you actually throw it down and say, this is the reality of it. But if you're ready to buckle up and get in there and play the game, you'll be amazed at the kind of person you'll see in three years, in five years, and in ten years. And you'll already be there. And the biggest anxiety you'll relieve is the anxiety in you is this is going to change and this is going to happen anyway. Why not be ready for it and enjoy it? How can they find out how to get a hold of your book, The Gig Is Up, and and a website, things like that? Well, Daniel, thank you so much for having me today. I am always available to connect at chunkofchange.com. That's where my labor of love is, my blog. And the book itself is available nationwide, whether it's Amazon or your local bookstore or Barnes & Noble. So I I would love for, obviously, people to read it and pick it up. But Daniel, you know, the way that I get chosen next is reviews. So I would absolutely be honored if you could provide a review on whether it's Amazon or LinkedIn. It would be absolutely um, my honor and my privilege uh, if you could uh, do that for me, and um, that helps me go to the next step in the gig economy. Absolutely, and there'll even be a fun one on the YouTube video. (laughs) (laughs) Again, Olga, thank you so much for being on the program today. My pleasure. You bet. So the book is The Gig Is Up. You can also find out more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter to keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.